All right, to start, we need to select an image from the Hubble Legacy Archive. And here it is. You can actually find a whole bunch of tutorials about this, um, but this is the easiest place. So again, from the Google machine, search Hubble Legacy Archive. It'll bring you to this landing page. Uh, for the most part, most of the images recorded by the Hubble Space Telescope are accessible here. Um, and this is going back to 1990 when the Hubble saw first light. So 30 years of data. A lot of it has not been processed. Um, some of it has been in famous images, uh, but it's all accessible for the public to do stuff with. So there's a bunch of things you can put into the search bar. You can search in coordinates, looking at a right ascension and a declination. You can search via a catalog number. So M101 would be Messier 101. That would give we search M101 and search. It'll pull up, tells you the coordinates right here. Um, and we have this grid and usual stuff, just like on Amazon or something like that. Results, how many per page do you want to show? Show 50 results per page. But this is hard to see. Um, but before I click on the images tab, showing you the target, um, the coordinates of the target, um, the catalog name can change. So Messier 101, for example, has another catalog name, uh, NGC 54 or 57. That would mean new general catalog 5,457. Um, the, the instrument used to record it, this is the wide field camera, um, spectral data. So what filter was over the imaging device when the imaging device was capturing um, the, the data. Exposure time. So a lot of information um, about the, the data that you're accessing. Number of exposures. So what this would mean, this were four separate exposures totaling a total exposure time of 720 seconds. Um, we can click on the images tab here and we can get a, a graphical display of the this galaxy Messier 101 and Hubble has um, a narrow enough field of view that the galaxy will take up more than the individual uh, CCDs on the imaging devices so typically what happens is you take pictures with the Hubble of different parts of it and you stitch them all together to create something much bigger so these are all different pieces of that galaxy um, the one I am going to search for, for this example, is easiest catalog number to find the example that I'll use for this, this whole imaging process, IC63. IC63 is a very faint nebula that is in the constellation Cassiopeia. It's actually right near the middle star of the, the W that makes the Cassiopeia constellation. Sometimes it is called the ghost of Cassiopeia because it's very faint. It takes a fairly long exposure time to draw it out. And so there's a whole bunch of images you can pick from using different, uh, different imaging uh, devices that are on the Hubble. This is done with wide field camera three. Um, some of them are color composited already. Some of them are uh, already stitched together. So what I'm gonna do because what we're doing for this whole project is we're, we're stacking images. We're not going through the process of stitching images. We're going through the process of stacking images. So I'm looking at these right here, IC-63 combined. So two different plates from this wide field camera three, um, different wavelengths that we have here. So infrared total, that would be a combination of infrared wavelengths. What I want to find are single filter images. So for example, this one right here, wide field camera three slash IR filter is F160W, which is actually, it's a shorthand for an infrared wavelength. So this HSD stands for Hubble Space Telescope catalog number, first of the images, wide field camera three infrared uh, in filter uh, 160W. 
which I'll show you later where you get the information that describes what wavelength that filter is allowing to pass. This one over here, um, UV Viz filter 336W. Um, this is probably 336 nanometers, so UV visible. Um, oh, I clicked it. When you click on the text, it selects the uh, image. Um, this is what I'm going to get because I know that this is a, a single filter image. I'm also going to get this one. Um, another one here. This is from the same image series. Um, again, I'm just using this catalog number as, uh, as a guide to tell me that it is indeed from the same series. Um, UV Viz 475. That's probably 475 nanometers. Um, w would typically stand for something like wide band. So I'm going to select that one as well. And then maybe I'll get this fourth one. Yeah, that'll give uh, good examples. For your project, you need a minimum of two. Um, I would say maximum possible five. Otherwise, you're going to be pushing your Photoshop to some limits depending on how big the individual image files are. Um, eh, heck, let's get this fifth one, 275. So I have, uh, let's see. Oh, another one, 110W6. And I'll pick later uh, which ones that I want to uh, mess around with. Oh, here's a good one. I'm getting distracted here looking at all these different uh, possibilities. 625, I have a I already have a 475. Oh, that's from a different series though. I'm seeing the O2. So that's not going to stack properly. So I'm going to stick with the ones that's 14186 underscore 01. That is from that imaging sequence. So I have one, two, three, four, five. This is an example where some of them were stacked. The 814, the 336, and the 275. Um, oh. I'm actually seeing something here where this image footprint is not the same as this image footprint. So probably good to unselect that because when you stack these, you want to make sure that you don't have to stretch or warp them. So there's a little nuance to selecting your images from the Hubble Legacy Archive. Um, but if you have any questions, again, ask me and I'll be able to point out which ones are good for stacking and which ones uh, might not give you something interesting. So this one actually doesn't have the, the nebula here. Uh, this is just in a particular visible wavelength where the nebula is actually not emitting too much. Um, I'm going to grab that just to see what will happen, uh, but I may not use it in the end. So now I got these images selected and what I want to do just like we're in some kind of online store, we add the selection to the cart. So then this cart tab comes up and I have four data sets. Again, you can think of these as their images you're downloading, but technically they are just raw data sets. You can download them sequentially, meaning one will download and then another window will come up and says save as and it'll do that a couple of times. Or you can download as one zipped file um, or you can use uh, something called a curl script, which is if you're working through a terminal, but we're not doing that. And then once I pick if I want sequentially or zipped, I will fetch the HLA data. And what I'll do is I will save it to my desktop where I save everything and we'll save it right there. And that is the process of getting raw images from the Hubble Legacy Archive. All right, so here's where you can find information about the imaging uh, tools that are on the Hubble Space Telescope, um, specifically the advanced camera for surveys, wide field camera three, and then previously operational instruments. These are the ones that you will encounter when looking for images. And the previously operational images you will see would be the wide field planetary camera and the wide field planetary camera two. This was the original um, camera that could, that could image in the visible spectrum and a little bit in the ultraviolet and infrared. Then it was replaced and then it was replaced again with the wide field camera three and then there was the advanced camera for surveys. Um, and so 
these these upgrades uh, were pretty awesome and now we can't upgrade it anymore and eventually who knows when but the Hubble will eventually be decommissioned so the previous uh, clip I was searching for images that were taken with the wide field camera 3 so on this page and the link is in the description for this you can click on the wide field camera 3 here's some information about it um, when it was installed servicing mission 4 May 2009 so think about like the quality of this camera is from the era of what digital cameras were giving us in 2009 and you know cameras that we have now are are much better uh, but the fact that the Hubble is above the atmosphere means nothing else can really compete with it in terms of imaging quality um, you'll scroll down and you go to the instrument handbook and then you can get a PDF of this, but they have it all put into uh, HTML pages, which makes it convenient. And the page that I'm going to, and you'll see why, is Chapter 6, UV, uh, UVIS Imaging with the WFC3. And this will give me spectral elements. And these are the filters that can go over uh, the sensor and block other light and allow only certain um, wavelengths to pass. There's also GRISMs, a uh, combination of a diffraction grating and PRISM, um, that are on this camera as well that allow you to do spectroscopy. Uh, but the filters that I encountered when I was getting the, the images uh, from this page, uh, I had 275W, 336W, F475W, F814W, and let's see what this says about them. So F475W, also known as SDSSG, Sloan Digital Sky Survey Green. And that's a filter that's centered at 477.3 nanometers and the width is 134.4 nanometers. So where is the filter centered and what is the spread of the filter? And you can also read more about what the what that actually means and so um there should be a little link to the appendix here i guess it's the same page right here widths are passband rectangular width uh so that's uh basically what we're looking at is let's go back to that so we're 477 plus or minus not 134 but roughly plus or minus uh, half of 134. Um, another one of the filters I uh, used for the images I got, F275W, let's see what that is. F275W, that's in the ultraviolet, 270 nanometers. Um, the 336W is 335 nanometers. So some of the information I'm getting really is in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Um, and then there was the 814. So this is 802 nanometers where this is actually sitting. And here's the width of it. So this is in the infrared, bleeding a little bit into the deepest red that we can see. So if you held up the 336, the F336W to your eye, if you saw that filter, you wouldn't be able to see through it. It would look like the deepest blue. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to see through this one at all. It would just look like a black filter. Um, the green one would look very green, and this one would look like a very, very dim red because most of the light that it's letting through is in the, infra is in the uh, infrared. And you can see there's a lot of filters that can be popped over the sensor uh, because we want to look uh, in different wavelengths. So you may encounter, uh, in particular, images that have the narrow band F656N, that's the hydrogen alpha, that that special energy transition in hydrogen from energy level three down to two. And so there's a lot of filters that center around there. Even one close to it, 658, that deals with the transition in nitrogen. So a lot of the filters are chosen, the narrow band ones, for particular element transitions. So if you put that filter over the imaging sensor and take an image, you're really only looking at that particular element doing a particular thing in the astronomer parlance helium 2 would mean helium 
that is actually singly ionized. So this is, um, yeah, so yeah, we have a lot of different filters that we can get into. Um, and then also some that correspond to, to molecules in the infrared. And then the grisms, useful range, 200 to 400 nanometers. So it's not really a full uh, range of spectroscopy for, for that particular grism. But yeah, the, the Hubble is loaded up with tons of spectroscopic elements um, so that we can learn everything we can and dissect the light from as many sources as possible. All right, here is a little workaround. If you get enough data and you want to compress it into a zip file and you're getting a gigabyte or more, it gets a little tricky. Sometimes the, um, the, the downloading tools of your browser might not like that. Uh, in particular, you have these FITS MEF files that we are going for. There's the FITS science file, but that is sort of a, some information is lost there. So we're going to go for these big FITS files, multi-extension FITS. It has a lot of other data that we're going to want to look at as well. Um, so to quickly get that without adding it to a cart, what you can do if you're on a Windows machine, you would right click. If you're on a if you're on a Mac, then you control click and say save link as. And then it would ask you, do you want to save the file? I already saved it, hence it's adding appending the little uh, prefix of one. Um, but that is a way to bypass putting them into a cart if you are having issues downloading a whole bunch of files at once. So you can directly download it from there. Um, so I'm going to save the rest of these again, control click or right click, save link as, and then should pop up with the file name and the extension. The image extension is a .fits, a fits image file. So that is a fully uncompressed image, stands for flexible image transport system. Um, basically all the pixel data is raw and scalable Oops, what I want. and what we're going to have to use is a special piece of software that will convert the fits file into a file that we can then open in Photoshop and you can see here that they're taking a little bit of time to download because and this is not my download speed for my connection this is coming from the the database's download speeds as well so the next video, next clip, I will show you how to convert the fits into a different image file format. In order to turn the fits files into what we call TIFF tagged image file format files, we need to use a piece of software called SAO image. It's funny seeing all whatever Google wants me to see. SAO image DS9. So SAO image DS9 and brings you to a site that is maintained. Actually, who is maintaining this site? You can learn a little bit about it. Uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. So that's what the, uh, the name means. And it is an open source application. We're going to go to download. And the most recent version uh, was released last month. Um, you can download it for the major operating systems or get the source code yourself. Uh, my guess is you will be either downloading the Mac or the Windows version. Um, and the same thing, uh, a lot of these sites, uh, you have to control click or right click. So if I wanted the Mac version, I would right click. And it's actually gonna bring me to let's see what it does here. You might have to, because this is a Google site, I found that if you take that URL and paste it into your browser bar, then it's going to ask if you want to download the DMG file that would be for Mac. Um, if you want to download the file for Windows, then you need to go Windows 64 bit. And again, this is a quirk of how they're hosting the site on Google Sites. Paste that URL into the browser bar and then it asks you to download the install file. Again, I already have the uh, Windows version installed on my machine and downloaded. So 
it's appending the parentheses one because it's a duplicate file. But again, a little trick here is when you click on the download link and it says redirecting you and it doesn't actually redirect you, um, just copy and paste that into your browser bar and you will get SAO image. Once you've installed SAO image, you can open it and this is the tool you will use to convert the FITS image files you've downloaded into image files that Photoshop can read. Photoshop can do a lot, and it's actually for a lot of astronomers, it's a, it's a useful tool, um, but it doesn't read FITS images. And there were actually, there are a few plugins you can get. Um, there are plugins you can get, actually one, there's a really good one, it's about $50, but for our purposes, this free software, SAO image, will suit um, our needs just fine. You can't drag and drop images into SAO image to open it. You have to go through the file menu, open, and then pick the image um, in your folder. It is good practice to create a folder for everything you're doing. So you'll save your raw image files, you'll save your Photoshop file, all of it in one place. Um, exports of your Photoshop file, um, just to, to keep them in one spot. And again, these are big images, so some of these may stress your computer's processor, um, but that's what your computer is for. So I got all of these in this folder I've created called HLA IC63 example. I'm going to go with the 275 um, nanometer image first. So I will select that, open. And then what you see is actually, it's just going to look black. And this field of view right here is actually this field of view that's in blue. This um, is going to tell me, I forget what this window actually is telling me right here. Um, but when you move over here, you have a lot of information about where are you pixel wise, and then what is the value of the, the data at that point. Um, in our for our purposes we're going to need to zoom and this these are these are actually menu buttons as well shortcut menu buttons so file if you click on file you have open save header um actually if i click header that'll be very interesting it's going to show me let's open this up so we can see it So I have both uh, data sets in this one fits file. Um, I'm going to go to the first one, select the header, press OK. And this actually tells me a lot of information that's stored in the image itself. It's interesting to note that anytime you take a picture with your phone, there is a file like this, it's called EXIF data, that is attached to images you take and it'll tag a whole bunch of stuff, your phone, possibly your phone's serial number, GPS coordinates, all of that information, um, possibly username and stuff like that, your phone owner's name. Um, and that's that makes it really easy to trace digital images. Um, for science purposes, it's really nice to have all of this data here. Uh, so if you're doing some serious science with the image, you can look at how the data was recorded. Um, so where we're going to look for information is actually exposure information. Um, we want to know how long of an exposure uh, was taken. So a lot of this is positioning, exposure, start time, and uh, essentially universal uh, time, uh, such as Julian date or universal coordinated time. The exposure time uh, based on all the individual images that got stacked to make this is 1200 seconds. So that's actually a, a fairly long exposure. Um, 1200 seconds is 20 minutes uh, worth of exposure time. So it is, and it also says what, what element, what filter, all of that. So there's a lot of image data that gets saved in case it gets needed. Um, so you'll have to read the header because I'm going to want you to find the exposure times for each of the images that you use to create your color composite image. So that's where you find the header under the file menu. 
let's go to zoom and let's not zoom in to just full size let's let's fit the whole image on the screen and so you can see there is a little tiny blip of something bright right there um, but this is where the scaling of the image is important so we can click on the scale menu here and it's just like these are shortcuts for the same scale menus here and a good place to start that I found, and this is where you'll have, you'll have to play around with what these do. Um, but under this scale menu, you have what kind of scale you want and where do you want to put the sort of the maximum value at? Do you want to stretch it all the way to the minimum maximum? Um, do you want to set 99.5% of pixel values as the maximum? Um, there's a lot of scaling uh, options you have, but the goal is to scale the data so you can see the object. So I found a good starting point is either the hyperbolic sign scale or the inverse, the arc hyperbolic sign, and Z scale. And then I start to see some image. Now some of these scales look a little, you'll see things get whiter or darker. Um, you have to use, you have to use your eye to figure out well, what's going to give me a lot of contrast in the data. The data is all there, but it's how are we scaling it? Essentially, where are we setting the black point of the image and where are we setting the white point of the image? Um, so linear, linear is, there's, there's also a lot of noise in this one. Um, you can see the nebula, but you can't really see it too much over the, the background noise. This bright thing here is a star that happens to be a bright star in the field of view. And that's what we can see here. That's hence the little diffraction spikes. Um, I'm gonna go back to the, yeah, I'm gonna go with the hyperbolic sign in the Z scale. Um, maybe we'll play around with it a little more, maybe 99.5, maybe down, see what 90 is at. Uh, I still like the Z scale, but play around with these. Um, they will do different things. You can dig into in the documentation um, and the, the reference guides here as to what those actually are, uh, but I don't want to get and go down too much of a tangent, no pun intended here, uh, for these, um, what these stretch functions will do for stretching out the dark point and light point of the image. I think I am going to go I'm going to go with the hyperbolic sign instead of inverse hyperbolic sign and I'll have it on Z scale. And then what I will do is I'm going to export as a TIFF and I want to export it into the same folder. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm using the same file name. Uh, but I'm, I might shrink it down and say 275.tiff. You have to add the file extension because the uh, program won't edit for you. So this is the 275 um, nanometer image. I'm just gonna save it as 275 TIFF. And that way I know which one that this came from. And save it. And now I have it, now no compression. We don't wanna compress it at all. And now I have this image has been basically formatted so Photoshop can read it. And you'll have to do this process with all of your individual um, black and white images. Our last step for stacking and colorizing the images is all done in Photoshop. So you'll open up Photoshop, hopefully the most recent edition um, this is Photoshop. Uh, which version is this? That's where it's going to be my account information. Uh, help. Um, about Photoshop. Let's double check. 22.1.0. Yep. This is the most recent version of Photoshop. So we will go to file scripts, load files into stack, and then those TIFF images, Photoshop can't do anything with these FITS files. 
but it can do stuff with these TIFF files. Um, just for simplicity's sake, and I actually don't think I would use this anyways, because there really isn't any data here, just stars. Um, so I'm not gonna insert that one. I'm just gonna use the ultraviolet and the infrared. So the data actually from in this image is actually, it's not a visible image. It's an ultraviolet and infrared composite. So I'm gonna insert these um, files and then I'll press okay. And what Photoshop does is it inserts the layers, um, layer upon layer, and we'll manipulate each layer and we're going to blend them. And if you noticed, let's see now, I can turn off the individual layers. Here is the, uh, the infrared one. There's a weird um, figure eight or infinity loop, um, Mobius loop that this is an artifact of something in the imaging camera. I don't know what it is. I saw this come up. There's another image of it there and other these other images. I actually don't know where this came from. This is not something in the nebula. This is an artifact of how this image, um, the raw image itself was processed. Um, and so, yeah, I'll have to look more into that. But I actually noticed this when uh, the Hubble actually released a version of the, or the Hubble Institute released a version of this, uh, which I will give as a link in class or as notes in this video. So each of these images, like if I have this top one and I turn these bottom ones off, I, I don't see them. These are all blending in what's called the normal mode. And so whatever is on top is completely opaque and you can't see what's in the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to select all the layers. So I'm going to press shift and select the bottom one in the list. You can also go to select all layers if you want. I just want to make sure that all layers are selected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the blending mode. And the blending mode for the layer, there's actually a whole bunch of different blending modes. And if you want to get into the, the weeds of Photoshop, learn what each one of these do. They do very interesting things. But the one that we will use is screen. So what screen does is it's as if we are projecting each of these onto a surface and so that the light is blending. It is an additive process rather than sort of a blocking or a subtractive process. So screen is the blending mode that you want for all of your layers. That way, if I turn off a layer, I can still see that even if I turn off a bottom layer, it takes away stuff on the bottom. So what's interesting is if I turn off the uh, the top two ultraviolet layers, all the starlight that we're seeing is in the infrared. But if I turn on the top layers, there's actually not much ultraviolet starlight uh, coming from those areas. So it's interesting, like you can see some ultraviolet, but when I turn on the infrared, we get to see much more stars. So the stars that we're seeing in this image they're actually not particularly hot stars. They are actually stars that are in the foreground, um, cooler than the stuff around the nebula. The only hot star that we can see in this is this guy right here. So this is another thing you can tell, just even though we're looking at black and white images, we can tell the temperature of a star uh, just by looking at, well, where is it, which part of the spectrum is it brightest in? And so I can turn off again. These are all, they seem bright and you think, okay, super hot stars, bright stars, but all their light here is infrared. Whereas if I turn this on and look at the ultraviolet, this is the only one that's shining in the ultraviolet. And so if I were to truly colorize these with real colors and get all the visible light in the middle too, this would be a fairly blue star. Whereas all of these stars would be probably white or yellow or orange. Before we proceed any further in Photoshop, you're going to want to save your Photoshop project. So we go to file, save as, and we're not going to save it as a TIFF. We could, 
but it is far more responsible to save as a PSD. That way you're going to save all the different layer adjustments that you're doing to these particular TIFF files. TIFF again is a tagged image file format. It's a type of uncompressed image file. Photoshop PSD is just Photoshop document. Um, I'm going to call this one HLA IC63 example, same as the, the folder that it's in, and it'll be a PSD file. So I'm going to save that. And now I have everything, even all the steps that I do are going to be saved in this PSD. And you will turn in uh, your final PSD file, as well as put exports of each image in your Google slide portfolio. So now that I've saved it, how do I turn this into a color image? I have to add color to each layer. So let's turn off all the layers, the little checkerboard grid means that this is all just transparent. Nothing will be displayed. Here's the first layer. Um, let's figure out what color do I want to color this and the way we'll go about doing this. And again, this is the beauty of fo Photoshop is it is layered editing. So you can edit an image, uh, do something to the whole image or even use uh, brushes to do something to part of the image. And then you could turn those edits on and off. So you can either compare what you edited to what was there before, um, or you can decide later, oh, I don't want that part that I've edited and just toggle it on and off. So this is what we call non-destructive editing of images. And this is again, what Photoshop really is built for. Um, so what I'm gonna do is that I'll take the first one. I wanna make sure that I'm selected only on the first layer. So these two are now unselected and I'm going to add an adjustment layer. And the adjustment layer I'm gonna do is called hue and saturation. So what that'll do, and again, it opens up this new adjustment layer that's going to, the way Photoshop works is if I have an adjustment layer here, it edits everything below it. So everything gets built up from the, the lowest, the first layer up. What I wanna do is I wanna press this little button here. I want this adjustment layer to affect only the layer below it, not all of the layers, but just the layer below. So this adjustment is what we call clipped to this layer. And I want hue and saturation to colorize something that is actually black and white data. So now I have a color here. I can move this window over to the side. Why did that select? Oh, undo. I had a magic wand that I touched something with. Magic wand select stuff. Um, and I'm going to bring the saturation of the coloring up to 100%. And then you can pick what hue that you want to colorize this layer. And notice again, pink is all the way over here, but pink actually is where uh, purple meets or blue meets red. It's actually not part of the spectrum, but we have it here. So this is like the, the edges of a color gamut and the saturation and the lightness allows you if I go super light, everything is just white. So I'm going to, I tend to keep the lightness at zero, right? Smack in the middle. I have the saturation typically at a hundred percent though. You can play around with this. You're going to have to use your own judgment. Um, but what this is doing is you're, you're trying to bring out detail, um, by colorizing it and contrasting it. Um, and you want to have it stand out against other detail again, in the other colorized layers that you'll have. So for the infrared layer, I'm actually going to go, this is going to seem strange, but I am going to pick calm. You think maybe use red or something. Um, but I'm actually going to pick something that's a little oranges. I want the stars since I know that these stars are the only stars that are really going to pop up in the image in the composite image. I want them to look like normal stars, quote, normal stars, meaning looking kind of whitish. If I, if I bring this over, bring the hue over to, to green and make all the stars look green, that's gonna, it will think it looks fake. Um, and again, every astronomical image is Photoshopped, but I just want it to, I want the stars to look kind of like how we expect stars to look so that I, I really focus on what's going on in the nebula. 
So I'm going to pick a hue that is somewhere over here, yellow, orangish, not too green. I could go into the, the bluish uh, part, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick over here. So I'm going to pick this yellow uh, color and yeah, you can, you can really dial it in to a particular integer. Um, notice the hue goes all the way up to 360. So this is where you would actually kind of come all the way back around. So it's kind of like a circle. Um, and so let's see that I'll start there again. The beauty of Photoshop is you can always go back and change it. So now that I have that layer colorized, I'm going to turn off that bottom layer. I'm going to turn on this layer now and let's give this one a color. So I'll do the same thing. I'm going to select the layer and I'm going to pick hue and saturation colorize, clip this to just that layer. So it doesn't do everything below it. Bring the saturation all the way up. And I want this layer to really stand out in sharp contrast to the one below it. So to stand out in sharp contrast to something that is orange yellowish, I might go blue, maybe a blue purple. Um, again, there's no right color to use here because we're looking, we're colorizing two ultraviolet layers. We just need to give them a color. It's going to help them stand out. So maybe let's do like a deep blue, violet, purple here. And we'll see how this is starting to mix. I can turn on this bottom layer and yeah, we're starting to, to see that there's a, a combining of colors and where the different layers combine to give a, a, a different shade than the individual layers that tells us something that's happening across all of the wavelengths. And again, it's kind of what we want to see here. We want to see what's happening in only one wavelength, but what's happening across all of the wavelengths. There's that, uh, figure eight thing, which again, I, that is a facet of something that was going on with the, the image and detector. I, I don't know what that is. Um, I'll have to do some digging. So let's turn off that image and let's turn off that image. I don't have to turn off the adjustment layers. I can turn off the adjustment layer. If I have the image on, it doesn't really do anything. If I turn off an adjustment layer when the image is off. And so I'm going to slide this open. One thing you'll notice with Photoshop, you can always slide things around and stretch things out to, to make your workspace how you want it to be. So I'm going to click the last layer. I'm going to show it. And I'm going to do a hue and saturation and again, clip to the bottom layer, bring up the or start colorize, bring the saturation up to a hundred. And I want a hue that's very different from what was there before. So I've already had the orange yellow. I've had something in the blue violet. Let's do something that's in the bluish or greenish. And let's see what that does now to our whole image. And again, I can go back and change these at any time. So let's turn on that bottom one. So now it's looking kind of like a greenish blue cloud. And then if I turn on this very bottom one and I have something that has, it looks like there's a lot of green in this too green for my taste, but again, it's showing the areas that are where they're combining and where they're different. So I can see all these stars look the same, but this one, is really starting to look like a different star because this one truly is a different temperature than all of the other stars. This one is a lot hotter. So that's something I can learn from this. I, have my, I don't want to actually move this. Um, and I don't want to have a magic wand tool on right now. So I'm going to go back I'm going to double click on this adjustment layer. So that'll bring you back to your hue and saturation um, adjustment and we can start to tweak it and you can start playing around with how you want this to look. Ooh, that's starting to look really pretty looking very, very red and pink, um, like a hydrogen cloud. Um, I can bring that over to this end and uh, looking too fluorescent there. Ooh, that purplish looks kind of cool, purple and yellow. But again, the color is, is really up to you. There is no right or wrong with this because we're colorizing things in this case that None of this is actually in the visible spectrum. So all we're trying to demonstrate is, is where 
things are actually combining and where things are truly happening in separate spectra. So again, all these stars are cooler stars, foreground field stars, and this one is a hotter star um, that is probably further away than all these other ones because it's shining uh, the same brightness as all these other ones, which means if it's hotter, it must be brighter. Therefore, it's further away because if it was at the same distance as these, it would appear a lot bigger. And again, this is rules of uh, your, your black body distribution and your distance modulus and your um, magnitude scales. Um, I'm going to leave it as this um, just for sake of demonstrating this. You're going to have a lot to play around with. Again, it's easy to get sucked down these rabbit holes of like just tweaking color here and there. Photo editing can be a very tedious process uh, because there is no right or wrong. You just want to have an image that is compelling, but also demonstrates a lot of what's going on with this cloud. So I can see based on these colors I've chosen, the stars are separate from the cloud. The cloud itself has a lot of detail and I can see lots of the structure in this cloud, which can then give us hints as to what kind of um, hydrodynamics are going on with this glass gas cloud. There's other things that you could do to get rid of these little um, sort of speckly lines um, in terms of these, these come from how the image and the sensor was stitched together. One thing that you could do because this is kind of on a warped page and you, you could crop this out if you wanted. Um, and I would do something like Let's see, perspective crop tool. So I would select here and I would move my, and I would move the other corner here. And this is actually going to end up distorting a little bit because this isn't exactly a rotated square. And then I would hit enter. And there I have uh, that weird sort of offset uh, facet of stitching the image together is now gone. Um, oop, don't want to start doing that again. Um, but this would be, again, an example of, you know, cropping it out in a way that is more pleasing. Where you're not wasting some of that extra space that's in there. Um, Last things you can do is you can do global adjustments for all layers. So um, one adjustment I am a huge fan of is the curves. And so if I add a curves adjustment layer, and this is going to adjust everything below it, this is where you can really start to bring out some of the contrast. Um, this represents this histogram represents how many pixels are super dark and how many pixels are super bright. We can do it in the different RGB channels because this is what's happening in the color space of Photoshop. Um, if you want to go down that route, you can look up Photoshop color spaces. But instead, I'm just going to do more of a global um, luminance based curves adjustment. So I can bring up the things that are super bright and I can bring down the things that are rather dark the shadows so that gives more of a dramatic contrast so this typical s style um, adjustment using the curves is one that brings up the brights and brings down the shadows you can do the opposite and bring up the shadows and bring down the brights and that gives uh, a different look depending on what you're trying to bring out in the image so i, I like to give it a little bit of adjustment here just to give it to make the bright parts really pop. And then, yeah, the, the sky's the limit with Photoshop. You have a lot of different filters you can apply uh, to the whole thing so we can reduce a lot of the, the pixel noise that comes up in these images. And again, this is what, what astronomers do when they are processing images um, from the Hubble Space Telescope. So as I said, I have an example of the actual processing that was done. Um, this is an astronomy magazine article. And here, this this actual imaging was um, done in August of 2016. And then it was released, I think, let me see, 
a few years later. So again, it takes time to download the data and process it. And they did a little animation um, showing the different um, layers uh, from the different filters in the data they got. So again, you can play around with this and there's that bright blue star that is a lot hotter than the rest. So they got some of the visual data that was uh, in there. So that's from the, the green uh, filter that was probably applied. Um, that thing is clearly a, a galaxy through the, the nebula in the far, far distance because it doesn't have diffraction spikes. Uh, and there's a, there's another one right there. So um, yeah, sky is the limit with uh, processing in Photoshop. Your goal is to get a compelling image, but something that tells us something scientific uh, about the image. One thing you can do um, to make your image a little less grainy um, is use these awesome filters uh, that can reduce the noise. Um, but what you have to do is you need to convert your entire stack of layers into what we call a smart object. So I'm going to go to layer, um, actually select all layers first. Then I go to layer, smart objects, convert to smart object. And what I will do here now is now that it's converted to a smart object and it is selected, it gives it the label of whatever layer was on top first, um, which happened to be that curves adjustment layer. And I'm going to go to filter noise and one good noise filter is the dust and scratches. The default setting, I think the, the radius is pretty high and the threshold is pretty low. And so it blurs everything out too much. Um, but what I want to do here is bring down the radius at which it's going to interpret the pixels and bring up the, the threshold uh, of what it actually considers noise. And it, it smooths stuff out. It doesn't completely get rid of the, um, the, the two lines coming down. But again, if I turn off preview, you can see what it was before. So it does smooth stuff out where I can still see the stars. I can still see different colors of stars and still see structure in the nebula, um, but not have a lot of the, the noisiness that is a facet of using the sensor as well. And again, this little box, this is my, my preview box of what I'm looking at. So you can play around with looking at something like diffraction spikes, how to keep detail in those while still smoothing out the, uh, the nebula itself. And so that happens using the threshold and radius. And again, play around with these. Um, all of these filters, you can look up on YouTube how to use a particular filter and you will get more information um, than you can process at one time. So I'm going to go with uh, maybe five and 30. And so I still get detail. Those lines are still there. I'm still seeing the diffraction spikes. I'm still detailing these stars here, but it is a little smoother than the graininess that was there before. And I will press OK. And so there is a smart filter applied to this curves one. Very last thing is we are going to export the master image and the individual images. So the way we export is file export. You can do a quick export as a PNG. Um, and that's a pretty useful, uh, format portable network graphic. Um, and it just, it's an automated process and we can say the, it'll give it the file name PNG. Um, and that should suffice. I'm going to give it a little addendum here that says full. So I know it's all wavelengths. Um, I'm going to press save. I also want to do the individuals. So what I'll have to do is go into my smart object, which opens it up as almost like a separate file. And I'm going to turn off two of the layers. And then I am going to close this and we will save it. Now I'm back in my noise corrected file here. 
um, with just one layer. And I'm going to export as, oh, not export as, you can do uh, JPEG and all kinds of stuff as to the quality of the JPEG and everything, but I just want the quick export of the PNG because the PNG is pretty much all I need. And so I will export that um, as, and I'll put in parentheses, the filter 814 and then press save. And then I will go back to my smart object and I will turn off the bottom one and turn on the next one and then close it and save it. And there we have the ultraviolet version or one of the ultraviolet versions. And then you can export and do the same thing. And I want you to do that for each of the compot or each of the individual colorized layers. That way you can present on your Google slide portfolio, the individual colorized layers and the final composite image. So you can really separate out what each layer is contributing to the final composite.